September already, actually. So um, I, I, I'm mindful that there's at least one person here from Australia who's like awake in the middle of the night watching this. And last night I had to stay up at midnight to have a call in California. So I, I empathize with this individual at least that, um, yeah, they're, they're awake in the middle of the night. So I don't want to uh, take too long here. Uh, thank you for joining me, everybody. Uh, today's talk is going to be an introduction to geographic information systems, which I'll refer to as GIS throughout this call. My name is Mark Litvinchik. I'm the author of Mark's blog. It's a tech blog that I've been running for about nine years now. I've been consulting for about 15 years. Um, I've been working in big data networking and in GIS. I'm a dual Canadian British citizen and I'm based here in Estonia. I've worked with banks, airlines, telcos, major retail chains. Um, I built the back end to Google's consumer barometer in 2014. I built a podcast CMS for Williams Formula One back in 2007. There's two applications I want to talk about first, and then two services I want to talk about, and they're going to get mentioned like throughout the whole um, throughout, throughout the whole presentation. So uh, the first is called QGIS. Uh, it's sort of like Photoshop for making maps. Uh, it's free. It's open source. You can just drag files onto it, and they'll render up on the screen. Its layers act the same way that Photoshop does. It has a Python API, its own virtual environment, and a REPL that you can work with that are integrated into the application. Um, there isn't any GPU and acceleration in it, though, um, and certain tasks have a, a bit of a, a steep learning curve to them. Um, it, it's usually fairly performant if you're working at the city level, but um, if you have a fairly complex scene, it can run a bit slower than some of its competitors. I have a link to a YouTube video there demonstrating that. Uh, it's over a million lines of C++ code, and it's about 13 years old. It's a massive project. Um, they've closed 25,000 tickets on GitHub, and they still have like 4,300 4, open. So it, it's a it's a mammoth piece of, piece of software. Um, it, it pairs well with Blender if you're going to be doing 3D workloads. It's, it's really focused on doing 2D stuff. The second is a, a commercial offering uh, from S3 called ArcGIS Pro, and it's about a hundred bucks a year if you're a student. It's between 800 to four grand a year uh, for the professional version. Um, it runs on Windows desktops. So if you, there, there's no application for the Mac or Linux, you'd have to use their online equip, uh, version for, for those oper um, operating systems. It is GPU accelerated and it does support stuff like AVX 512. It is, it knows how to, get the most out of the hardware it's running on. Um, and one of the major UI differences is it has a ribbon menu at the top where Q just doesn't. So that ribbon menu makes it really easy to sort of guess where functionality might be hidden in the software. And there's a lot of great YouTube tutorials online that are nice, short and concise. And a lot of them are actually made by people that work at S3. It too has a Python API and a REPL. Um, and in the UI, you can actually generate the Python code that you would need if you're trying to automate something. Um, it has 743 DLL files compared to QGIS's 135. So that gives you an idea of just like the breadth of features that it has. If you can imagine each DLL file is a bit of functionality, 734 of them is, is, is massive. Um, and its installation footprint is about twice the size of that of QGIS's. Um, there's a library called GDAL, which I'll come on to here in a second, which is fundamental for um, for opening and, and saving uh, GIS files. Uh, it uses a slightly older version than QGIS, but I, I, I imagine at some point S3 will we'll catch up and get to 3.7 at some point. Um, most people that do GIS work are in the public sector, and for the most part, they're not typing on terminals all day. They want to launch like a an application that looks like Microsoft Office and do all of their work there. So S3 is absolutely won over public sector work all around the world. Um, they have a conference every year in LA. It has like 20,000 people attending. It's absolutely massive. Um, I suspect like 80 <coughs> profits in, in the GIS space are probably made by this company. Um, very good 3D support. Um, just absolutely fantastic. So if you have a GPU accelerator, it's like playing a video game. Um, really fantastic there and they have over 10,000 free GIS data sets so you can just search and add into your maps so you don't have to do like tons of ETL if they've already got the data set there for you 
Um, and there's a lot of data processing in the GIS world where you're just using public data sets that are exist in the ether already. So they've gone through and done all those transformations ahead of time. Um, there's two online services that I will describe as Photoshop for map making. Uh, the first one is Carto. It originally started out as just doing hosted uh, post GIS uh, 10, 12 years ago. And then BigQuery in 2018 released GIS support uh, and they, they moved to more towards um, cloud-based storage of, of, of the data. So if your data would typically live on BigQuery or Databricks are one of those providers now. And they're a major contributor to Jack DeckGL, which is a, a very fully featured uh, web-based map uh, JavaScript library. So um, the maps that you see in Carto and that you'll see here and unfolded here in a second, those are rendered with DeckGL. And one of their competitors is called Unfolded. And I've screenshotted their stuff quite a bit in my blog post. One of my clients, Open5G, uses them. So we've we've loaded loads and loads of tables into BigQuery. And um, we use this for rendering maps. Um, the, the idea is that you're rendering stuff generally as hex tiles. And that way, um, you're sort of grouping together your points. And it'll, it'll render quite quickly. There's. Uh, a diversity problem with file formats in the GIS world. There's like at least 80 vector file formats that you could come across. Uh, with every client, the, one of the first things I do is build an Excel sheet of like, what's all the data that they have and what format it is, it, is it in? Does it have valid geometry? Is it possible to even download it with curl? Or is it hidden behind Cloudflare? How many rows there are? And um, GDAL is a very large open source application that can read most of these and write most of these. Um, so I took a screenshot of its source code folder there where you can just see like all the different formats that it supports. Anything that you're working with that works with maps probably has GDAL hidden in it somewhere for doing all its file IO. It, it's an absolute dominant library for doing this sort of work. Um, and this year, DuckDB the DuckDB team in Amsterdam put together an extension for handling GIS workloads inside of DuckDB, and they integrated GDAL into it. So on day one of their release, you could read and write like 50 different formats, which was pretty incredible. Um, yeah, this is a, the list of all the different drivers that are now, now supported with uh, DuckDB's geospatial extension. I think everyone here knows what longitude, latitude, and altitude are. Um, and what I'll say is it's, it's, it's when you're working with a data set, it's good to kind of have an idea in your head of what the longitude and lat latitude of that data set is. Uh, because in a lot of different uh, file formats uh, for in the GIS world, they actually switch latitude and longitude. <laughs> um, and it will mess up your calculations if, if, if you don't have them in the right order. And I've, I've had a few painful experiences where I've had a job run for two days and I go to check the results of it. And it turns out I had latitude and longitude mixed up for uh, some source of data. So um, it's, it's good to have some, some sort of a mental model of where, where your data is in the world when you're looking at it. Uh, for instance, for California, I'm always expecting to see the longitude, like usually like negative 125, something like that. And I know that that, that wouldn't be a valid latitude. So I, I, I know I'd, I'd have stuff in the right order uh, when I'd be working with data from California. There's three different basic types of, of GIS information. The first is raster, where it's like a 2D image. You can think of it like a satellite photograph. Uh, the second are vectors, where you can think of them as like regular 2D and 3D geometry, like points, polygons, lines, strings, that sort of thing. And the third is point clouds. So these three-dimensional um, dots in space that can describe um, the, an area with its volume and in, 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 in detail in, in the three-dimensional space. W within any map, you will have layers. So here we can see at the bottom, there's a satellite image base map. And then above that, there's a roads layer, which is made up of line strings. And above that, there's a labels layer uh, where you can see all the street names on it. Um, so with layers, you can see here in QGIS at the bottom left of the screen, um, I have Cardo's uh, New York streets dragged in. 
And then uh, on top of that, there's all the subway stations that um, uh, for New York. And when you're dealing with layers, sometimes you'll have a file format that can have multiple layers inside of it, like a G package file, for instance, or sometimes you'll have a data source, which typically would only have one single layer inside of it. Uh, typically, the, you can have GeoJSON files typically only have a single layer inside of it. They do have the, the ability to have multiple collections, but I, I tend to not see that used. And you can see you can really go to work with layers. Like on the right-hand screen here, you can see that they're describing all the, the various uh, uh, topology in a, in a particular area somewhere in the States. Map tiles is typically how uh, maps are distributed on the internet. If you think back to Google Maps when it started back in um, in uh, 2004, I think is when it first went public, um, they would uh, send out tiles where you'd have for any sort of zoom level, you'd have an X and Y uh, coordinate and it would send you out a tile for that. Now there's pre-rendered rastered map tiles and then there's a, a newer format called vector map tiles where it sends out vector information. Those are much smaller and they're very flexible for styling. Um, in any sort of map making, you would typically have a base map tile that you would put in place for, say, satellite imagery or like pre existing rendered maps that you'd work on top of. Um, in uh, ArcGIS Pro, there's actually in, in, the, in the ribbon at the top, there's a base map drop down where you can actually see what the maps look like and you can add them into your scene. Um, so it, it makes it very easy for getting like context right off the bat. Um, in QGIS, there's a plugin called Tile Plus, and with it, there's like 30, 40 different base maps that you can add as layers on top of your, um, uh, in, into, into the map that you're working on. And then you can actually control like um, the, uh, the opacity and the blending options and everything. So you can have multiple maps together. You can have like a, a map of the world at night, and then on top of it, overlay it with um, all the uh, lights that um, are in the world uh, at night. Uh, so you, you get these really um, vivid nighttime uh, maps of the world. Um, other ones like uh, Estri's World Imagery is really good. Uh, Bing Virtual Earth, these, these look really nice when you can look at them and um, uh, bring them into your own map scenes. I don't know if it violates anyone's terms and conditions and of those 40, I'm sure some must, it must violate some of them. So on the left here, I've actually grepped out all of the tile servers that that plugin uh, for QGIS uses. And you can see about a long list of uh, URLs there, and they all have the same sort of um, pattern to them where there's an X, Y, and Z component to their URLs that you could pass in and, and get back your tile for it. Um, and there's a, there's a Python library called XYZ services. And if you're trying to integrate this into some sort of script that you're trying to automate, um, something like this might 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 help you uh, fetch those uh, uh, those tiles easily. Um, you can also layer satellite images on top of other satellite images. Um, here, um, I, I brought up a satellite photograph where I live, and S3's uh, image of this area is from 2019, but Maxar has a picture from 2022. Um, unfortunately, Maxar isn't integrated into ArcGIS Pro. So I had to go to uh, a website that showed their satellite image. I took a screenshot of it, took that PNG, I dragged it into my map, and then I digitized it so that um, there, as soon as I put three points in, it overlaid on top of the other satellite image perfectly. And I was able to export an XML file describing that projection um, that can now pair with that PNG file. So if I take that PNG file over to QGIS or somewhere else, it will look for the XML file. If it sees that, it will actually adjust all of the um, projections perfectly. So it, it sits on top of the map quite nicely. There's three major forms that you'll find um, vector data serialized in. One is GeoJSON. The other one is well-known text. And finally, there's well-known binary. Um, GeoJSON is probably one of the second easiest to, to, um, to grasp. And with GeoJSON, you can save it into a .geojson file on GitHub and it'll actually render it in a nice map for you. 
WKT is actually quite extensible. It can do much more than just uh, basic vector geometry, um, but it's more verbose and, and, and longer. Uh, WKB is the one I most commonly come across uh, when I'm doing my work to the point where I start to recognize patterns in the hex. So if you wanted to actually extract out some vector data from OpenStreetMap, I have an example here where I've, I've placed the map over Estonian Parliament and I hit the export button and that download uh, that created a 122 kilobyte download map.osm and inside of it actually it says XML data. And if I run GDAL's ogre info tool, it'll tell me that there's five different layers inside of this file of points, layer, lines, layer, multi-line string, multi-polygon, and others. And I can actually open that map.osm file in DuckDB and extract out the information for each layer. So here I just got the first record from three different layers. So the first layer was a points layer. And you can see there that um, it extracted out a zebra crossing. The second one was a, um, a cobblestone um, passage and it, it was drawn out as a line string. And the third one doesn't have any tags, but it's the um, it's the governor's garden, which is next to parliament right here. And it's a multi-polygon where they've drawn that out. Um, just for reference, I'll be sending out a YouTube video and a slide deck after this, so you don't need to take notes really fast. And if if I if I skip past some code quickly, you'll you'll be able to pause the video later and and read through it if you want, or just copy it out of the slide deck. There's a consortium called the Open Geospatial Consortium, and they've tried to create a whole bunch of GIS standards, and they've done a very good job of doing so, like GeoPackage, GeoParquet. Um, Doing the, the the main one that um, I'm, I'm really glad that they did was simple features access. And what that did was define a whole bunch of geometry and its hierarchy to one another, like lines and the line rings belong to a line string, um, polygons belong to multi polygons, that sort of thing. They define the uh, SQL function names that you would typically use in a GIS database. And they've defined a list of abbreviations so everyone's really on the same page. So if you learn how to use uh, the GIS functions of BigQuery or the GIS functions of PostGIS or DuckDB, they look very similar to one another. So there's not a lot of relearning or or really different systems to work with. The standard's, uh, I think, about nine years old right now. Um, it's been very well adopted. One of the more annoying things I've come across uh, is invalid geometry. Um, where for whatever reason, the software you're working with says that it's valid and it's fine. And then when you go to load it into something like BigQuery, I've actually printed out all the different error messages I've seen BigQuery give me over the last year. And I removed out all the numbers so I could um, generalize these. Um, and there's a case where you might have geometry that sits on a 2D plane that, that's completely valid, but uh, in BigQuery's geography type, uh, which is a spherical ge geometry model, it might be invalid for some reason. Um, I, I don't have a lot of clear uh, fixes for this, but I, I I do have some some hacks that sort of work. Um, the first is that I would convert the geometry, say if it's inside of uh, PostGIS, I would um, sorry, I would um, export that out, turning the geometry into JSON. Uh, strings. And then when you do that, the uh, the projection system will be in their CRS. I would remove that because BigQuery doesn't like it. I would then turn that into base64, which by default, uh, Postgres will turn into multi-line base64. And I would just make it a single base64 string. Dump that out. Make sure that the CSV files being dumped out are, are no longer than, than four gigabytes each when they're decompressed. And then load that CSV into BigQuery and then um, create the geometry column where I've converted that um, base64 back into a string and use the make valid function uh, that uh, Google has for um, their um, GeoJSON to geometry uh, functionality. And that will try to correct any, any broken geometry. 
Um, the next one is to consider making the geometry a lot more simple than it is. Sometimes there's a lot of detail that may or may not be needed. And you can create um, generalized outlines around complex polygons. They're called convex hulls. And um, just about every GIS database has this where they can simplify it. So on the left here, you can see like extremely complex uh, border around the, the Gold Coast in Australia. Um, but that, that could be quite heavily simple, simplified with a convex hull. And the other piece is actually like short, shortening the um, how accurate the floating point numbers are, are um, for uh, the latitude and longitude. Sometimes if you go beyond five or six decimal places, it's, it's too much detail as it is. So there's, there's a bit of Python here where I, I truncate it up to only six points of precision. And then if I have uh, from that, if I create any duplicate uh, points, it will remove those duplicate points. So I have only unique points going. And sometimes with that simplified geometry, then you'll get around whatever invalid geometry errors you might have had. Uh, so for clustering, I, with my clients, we've typically been using something called H3. It's a hexagon clustering system that Uber put together a few years back. Google has something similar called S2, and there's a few others out there. Um, but with this, you have uh, zoom levels, um, just like with typical tiles, say like 1 to 15, and um, or from 0 to 15. And at 0, you can see in the top left here, it creates about five large hexagons around uh, the bulk of main, mainland United States. It's actually good for partitioning out data because one of the hexagons is over California, which is always a large data set. One is over um, a heavily populated area of Texas. One's over Florida, uh, Eastern Seaboard, and then the Great Lakes area. So sometimes you can roughly divide a data set up into five parts that are fairly uh, similar in size to each other. Uh, simply by partitioning on, on zoom level zero. On the next to that, you can see that there's a zoom level seven where I've zoomed into San Francisco. Um, it's really handy to be able to take a whole area to um, every data point you have in the area associated with the hexagon, and then you can build up averages, mins, max, medians, all these sorts of um, statistics about it. And for every one of the 90 data sets I'm loading in for Open 5G, we've calculated these. So you give me a point in San Francisco, and I can give you 90 pieces of information about that. And I can contrast that to any of the other hexagons in San Francisco or anywhere else in the United States. So, And it, it makes data sets much, much smaller because you only have so many hexagons for the US at any given res, uh, resolution. Um, so you can calculate all your stats that way. On the... Here, I hope this isn't too small. I, I show an example. There's a Microsoft Buildings table, and I have some geometry there, and I've calculated H3, 7 zoom, 8 zoom, and 9 zoom. I typically keep these as, as text hexag um, in, in, in hex form so that I can see if it starts with 87, 88, 89, and I can see that I haven't mixed up latitude and longitude in my calculation, and they're probably accurate. I have a link here to uh, what the h 3 index.versal.app, and you can actually paste these in here and I'll, I'll fly in a map to show you where the hex is. So typically where I've got latitude and longitude mixed up, it'll fly to somewhere in Antarctica. So, um, but if it flies somewhere in the United States, I, 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 I know I've um, got the uh, calculation right. Um, and this is one of the maps I made with Open 5G last year where we looked at where the internet was getting faster and slower in the United States. And we have a lot of measurements for this because ISPs are, are forced to share this information with the FCC and the FCC publishes it. And you can see if I zoom in this to San Francisco, it's greatly simplified down to its hexagon. So I can see that, you know, in the north bit here, things stayed relatively the same. There's a few parts where internet sped up, but, you know, the bulk of that peninsula, uh, the internet slowed down over six months in um, 2022. Uh, QGIS, I typically would render GeoJSON hex, um, hexagons ahead of time um, and then load them into QGIS. And I've done that there in, in two examples, uh, blog posts that I have linked to down there. Uh, this one is showing uh, in Australia where all the AI detected roadmaps uh, Microsoft has found recently. So the world is round, the world is a sphere, but we're typically looking at 2D screens. So there's there's a whole science around how do you 
create a 2D image of a distorted lumpy string, a lumpy sphere. And um, in the 1980s, this became like a really big problem. Um, there's a ton of satellite data coming in and they're trying to project it properly back onto a world map so they could overlay it and see what's going on. Um, and there's also a lot of different projections that serve different purposes. Um, and so the European Petroleum Survey Group, EPSG, you'll see that a lot in this, in this industry, um, they've created this clearinghouse where people can describe a projection to them and they'll give them an ID number. So BigQuery wants everything in 4326. It sounds like a very odd number, but like I just remembered off the top of my head because it, I'm constantly trying to find what projection system my data originally came in and convert that into 4326. And the software that's typically doing that is called Proj. It's been around for a very long time. It's very well battle tested. Um, quite likely, if you're looking at digital map, Proj's library is hiding underneath it somewhere. So in the Western world, uh, the top left map here is one that we all recognize. Um, and that's projected in 4326. Um, and uh, it even happened to see like dropped by accident there. Sorry about that. Um, and this map distorts the earth in a very strange way. Canada's big, but not that big. Russia looks like it's almost like two or three times wider than Africa, but Africa is about 18% wider than Russia. And when I start to zoom in, even to like EU member states like Estonia, Estonia looks nothing like it does on a globe. It's like really wide and it's, it's, it's very strange. Below is another projection system, 3300, which is Estonia centric. And Estonia is shaped like it is on a globe there where it's roughly as tall as it is wide uh, on the mainland. Uh, but when I zoom out to look at the rest of the world, in creating that compromise for Estonia, the rest of the world is like this weird swirly projection here. So um, th there's, there is good reason for all these projection systems to exist and Project does a very good job of translating between them. So if you're using QGIS or, or, um, or, or S3's ArcGIS Pro, like you can switch back and forth. It's, it's, it's not such a big deal. Inside of um, QGIS actually, they, they describe what the definitions of each of those um, projection systems are. And you can even see that they're described using WKT. So WKT is not just for geometry, but can also describe projection systems. And you can see they go into a great level of detail. There's a, there's a lot of minutia going on there. Um, you guys can pause this in the video, but like WS, uh, WGS84 and 4326 get convoluted with one another. And most of their characteristics are completely compatible with each other. In fact, he just gives uh, WGS84 as a coordinate reference system for 4326. And even on Stack Overflow, people f managed a way to find a difference. It's... <laughs> um, there's probably a reason why those GIS courses in university last into the years. Whenever you're packaging GIS data, uh, typically, unfortunately, a, a lot of people create CSV files or JSON files, and that's just the way the world is. Um, I, I'm not a fan of CSV because ultimately everything becomes a string when it's in a CSV file. And then it's up to me to try to figure out what types these things originally were. There's no, there's no type enforcement going on there. Um, but nonetheless, CSV files exist. If you're going to create these files, try to sort by the longitude column because that typically has the greatest amount of entropy. And if you sort by the longitude column and you use um, parallel uh, PIG um, pigs, which is an anagram of GZIP, that will compress better than GZIP, but still give you a compatible file. And you can see here that uh, a file that was originally like 1.8 gigabytes is actually just 1.3, simply because it was sorted on longitude and then uh, PIGS was able to get a little bit more um, out, out of the file with, with, um, with, with its uh, more up-to-date algorithms. And also consider like how many, if you're using CSV or you're using JSON, then the latitude and longitudes uh, or the points are going to be described as floating point numbers as text. So consider how many points of precision you actually need. So if it's just at the city level, like one point might be enough. If it's a neighborhood, two points might be enough. Um, you, you don't need to have like super, super long floating point numbers for data sets necessarily. And um, 
these data sets they tend to grow, not shrink, and they live forever. So um, you do a lot of people a lot of favors just by simply like simplifying and sorting. Here's another one with a line delimited JSON. And with this, I've taken all the white space out of the JSON uh, files. I've sorted the keys, and then I've used a gzip compression. And I've managed to take a file that was 7.8 megabytes and bring that down to like 4.6 megabytes. And in fact, uh, this particular data set, the JSON version is actually roughly the same size as the CSV version. So, um, you know, sorting by keys helps the uh, the deflate algorithm really figure out where the patterns are and, and how it should be compressing a lot better. Um, we have a LiDAR expert in this call today. I'm not going to call now, but uh, he might start laughing at me here in a minute. Uh, this is QGIS here on the left-hand side, and you can see there's a satellite map here on the left. And then on the right is LiDAR imagery that the Estonian government took and they released for free. And that LiDAR data, you can't see it here, but it's actually three-dimensional. It has all of the color. Uh, it, it was able to identify the material that the lasers hit. Uh, it knows if it's hit water, it's hit the ground, if it's hit metal, if it's hit, hit foliage, it's absolutely incredible. Um, the files are absolutely huge. The, it, there, there's no getting around it, but um, it, it, it records the world in 3D in, in, a, in a very special way. Um, and so you can actually play with the US Geological Survey has LIDAR data on AWS. They have almost 2000 data sets. Just getting the file listing of those data sets produces a 106 gigabyte file <laughs> listing. That's how many files there are. And uh, together there's about 300 terabytes worth of data. And I showed the example of just downloading one of the, um, the LiDAR files there. Um, there's tools online where you can just segment out a little bit of geography in the US. And I'll tell you what files you need for that little geography. Um, I don't know if anyone else here is a fan of TikTok, but I saw a video come up said, have you ever wondered how Google Maps is made? And they're showing a camera from a company called Vexel that can actually take these LiDAR photographs from space. And you can see there on the right-hand side, one of their photographs, they took a picture of uh, the Hard Rock Hotel in Florida. And it just looks absolutely incredible. Absolutely amazing. Like satellite photographs, wouldn't really give you like that detail. It just looks absolutely fantastic. So we're able to fly these things on airplanes and just collect tons and tons of data. It's, it's really fantastic stuff. Um, I've taken a screenshot from one of my colleagues' um, presentations that he put online where he showed that um, instead of having to send engineers around to try to figure out how to deploy 5G, uh, you can simply use LiDAR data to simulate where 5G signals would be, um, would be affected. Um, and this presentation is just a, a static screenshot here, but it actually it's it's completely three dimensional. If you go to that that link down there, you can see how um, uh, 5G gets modeled around San Francisco. Um, data sets. I want to talk about OpenStreetMap. It's a very popular data source. It might not be always complete or always accurate, but it, it has so much information there. It, it always seems to be a good starting point. Um, when you click on any point on an open street map, um, you can see all the different features that it has nearby. Um, it'll actually render those up out in a list on the screen. And there's ways of actually getting that exported out, um, which I'll, I'll go to in a minute here. Um, open street map uses 3857, not 4326. So there'll be some projection um, tasks up ahead here. OpenStreetMap has an editor as well, too. So you can go on there and you can edit your local area and you can make improvements and fixes and add more metadata. Um, they have a huge community online. They're just always working on this and always trying to improve the, the data set. But there's always more work to be done. I, I, I noticed recently that OpenStreetMap had half as many Starbucks locations in California as Starbucks claim that they have. So it shows like how much metadata we still need to collect. And also they're not interested in people doing bulk changes. Um, there's a consortium that recently put together like 30,000 building heights around the world uh, as a single data set. That would not be accepted into OpenStreetMap unless they're imported one by one and checked. 
some AI generated uh, data is just not accepted, which is partly why it's you don't see these mass bulk changes every day. Everything has to really go past human eyes. There's a company called Geofabric, which produces extracts of the OpenStreetMap data. The, the data set itself is, is massive, but you can get different regions or even uh, down to cities. Um, and they'll every night they, they produce these um, OSM files, these protocol buffer files, or you can get them as XML if you want them, or shape files in some cases. And you can open those up in QGIS, PostGIS, uh, DuckDB. There's, there's tons of tools in which you can take that data and then start working with it either visually or with SQL or Python or another programming language that you want to use. Um, these slides are sort of uh, alien to the rest of the presentation, but I just want to highlight Google Maps has a real moat in GIS. This was really um, something they knew. It's been important for, for multiple decades now. There's so many aspects on Google Maps that I haven't found parallels with, with other systems, let alone free data sets. Uh, there's a guy named Justin O'Brien who, um, who went through and documented this. Uh, sorry, hello? Oh, I think someone was just on the phone. Um, so there, there's, a, there's a blog post there where it goes through just all the things that they seem to have that no one else has just yet. So. Um, they also have all the users. I mean, in the U.S., what, of the top six, four belong to them, <laughs> Google. Um, this is Apple Maps and MapQuest that are um, at the top there. I wonder why OpenStreetMap isn't in there. Surely they have more than um, 600,000 people a month on their site. Maybe not in the U.S. I'll talk about GIS applications for a second. The first one is address geocoding where you can give an address or some sort of description or a point of interest name uh, to a system, and it can figure out the latitude and longitude of where that is located. That's called address uh, geocoding. And there's also reverse geocoding, where I can give a system a point, and it can tell me everything about that point. Like here, I, I clicked on Estonian Parliament and told me it's in, in Tompea Castle. Um, it's a historical monument. It's in the center of town. It's in Tallinn. It's in Haryama. This is postcode. This is the country it's in. Um, so both of those are are actually fairly decently sized industries. Some companies charge like six figures a year for their databases, um, or even you know approaching more than half a million a year for uh, make, being able to make bulk API calls uh, just to do the, those those two tasks. Putting those databases together too is. Um, quite time consuming to sort of gather all the data and, and to have something that's really good and accurate. Uh, root finding, there's probably four really solid open source engines for doing root finding. Here I'm using um, the PG rooting extension for Postgres. There's a link to the blog post in there. Um, there's a website that holds the scheduling information for like 2000 public transit providers around the world. And so um, Flixbus, which is based in Germany, they put all their data there. And it's just like literally all the files you'd find in their database. Um, and so I took all their all their data, ETL'd it into some nice tables in Postgres. And I'm able to, I, I was able to build a, a root finder across their network um, using all that data. So here I said, I want to start in Vienna and end up in Oslo. And it told me all the stops I'd have to make with their systems in order to get from one location to the next. And on the left here, I've actually rendered out their, their network across Europe. So that's a really good end-to-end -end isolated uh, tutorial to walk through if you're, if you're really new to GIS. Uh, the other one is uh, isochrones. So on the right here, there was a map, I think it's about 100 years old now, maybe even older. And it was showing from Europe how long it would take to get to certain parts of the world. So some places are within 10 days, 10 to 20. Um, there's parts of Australia that would take up to 40 days to reach. And on the left here uh, is Chrono Trains, which came out last summer. And you can click any, on any train station in Europe and it'll figure out how far you can travel within five hours. Uh, it's a really beautiful map and it, it shows how Northwestern Europe has very good train connections. <laughs> Um, when you start to move that over the Iberian Peninsula or over the Baltics, you get very, very different looking isochrones. Um, another uh, GIS application that's come up recently has been quite popular, segmentation. So companies like Planet 
they've built these satellites out of uh, cell phone parts and they've, they've put tons of them into space and they're able to take a, a picture of the earth every day, the entire earth. Now, when you have all that imagery there, if you wanted to like say identify what you're looking at, that would be segmentation. And you could do that by hand, but when you have a picture of the earth every day, it's, it's too much information. There aren't enough people on the planet to sit and to uh, properly identify all the features and to figure out what's changing day to day. So this is where AI is really coming in. And um, Meta have a segment anything model, and there's a whole bunch of other ones out there that are making attempts at doing automated segmentation. I th I, that that world still has quite a ways to go. I, I've, I've been looking at those this year, and um, um, they, they don't seem to replace humans just quite yet. So the GIS world, you can get by with mostly open source software. Um, GDAL, Proj, GEOS, those are the three major primitives that everything else will be using. Um, for databases, PostGIS is really battle tested. It's, it's very feature rich. If you're writing code in Python, Shapely is fantastic. Um, there's, in terms of databases, PostGIS, it, it, it doesn't scale extremely well. Its performance isn't great, but its functionality is fairly rock solid. And I, I've never found a bug in PostGIS. ClickHouse is very quick, but its GIS support is extremely limited at the moment. DuckDB is, is also fast, not as fast as ClickHouse, but it, it's still quite fast. Um, its GIS support has is, is come leaps and bounds this year with the spatial extension. It's absolutely incredible. Um, if you're working at like US scale or, or larger, I, I haven't found anything outside of BigQuery that is super performant. So there, there's, there's a real need in the database world for more performant databases to uh, add GIS um, capabilities to them. And for the most part, like BigQuery's biggest customers are storing ad data and storing like like game telemetry data. Like the GIS stuff isn't isn't a major revenue driver at the moment, I don't believe. So um, hopefully some of these other databases will, you know, uh, hear hear the cry that um, they, they need better GIS support. DuckDB is the one that I, I recommend for most stuff now, and I, it's been my daily driver this year. If you're on Mac OS and you're doing GIS work, you probably can get by with a terminal, some sort of text editor, QGIS, maybe something like Tableau or Excel or Jupyter Notebooks for doing data visualization. eBeaver, if you're uh, trying to visualize how your databases are structured and how, how they work together. Um, there's a program called Homebrew, which is a package manager, which is absolutely fantastic. Um, for installing the JS stuff. I, I really haven't found something on another platform that's, that's quite the same. Um, but with that being said, um, there is no exclusive software on the Mac outside of Homebrew. Um, and there's tools like ArcGIS Pro, which are probably the most feature rich you can find. The desktop app only runs on Windows. Everyone else has to use the browser version. And it's a desktop app, it's GPU accelerated. Uh, QGIS on Windows uses newer versions of GDAL than they do on Mac OS. So like if you want GeoParquet right now, you'd have to use QGIS on Windows. Um, on Macs, like, yeah, people attach external storage to their laptops, but in like Windows, like it's not, it's not weird to have like six disk drives plugged into a machine. So, and the cost of these systems, like it, it's, you know, for a thousand dollars, excluding your monitor and GPU, you could have like a supercomputer running Windows 10. Um, so I, I, I have three MacBook Pros that are underneath my desk here and they're all turned off now. I, I, I'm just, I've moved back to Windows 10 because I have Ubuntu for Windows so I can still do all my Linux stuff, GPU acceleration, all the apps, everything's here. So, um, yeah, if, 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 if you're going to buy a computer before you do this, uh, please be considerate before walking into the Apple store. With that, I'd like to say thank you. Um, I'm going to turn off the recording here and then I'm going to open it up to uh, to questions. So if you just give me one minute to stop.